Don't brag because you're in the truth of God. It's the truth of God in you. Amen. The devil know that this message of holiness is the strongest message in the world. Yeah. Very strong. That's why the false prophets, they don't bother these mega preachers. No. They attack the truth of God. That's right. Because they see the strength in it. Amen. They say, hallelujah, glory to God. They see the firmness in it. That's right. That's right. You can't turn on no church program and see all these men. No. no. You see a bunch of fairies. That's right. Dairy queens. That's right. And mostly all women. Amen. Amen. All right, listening. By which also ye are saved. If ye keep in memory what I preach unto you. Do you hear this? Unless ye have believed in vain. Unless you believe in vain. In vain. If thou put the brethren in remembrance. Do you hear this? Now in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and we're at verse 6. If you put the brethren. In remembrance of these things. In remembrance. Of these of things. Of these things. Thou shalt be a good minister. Wait a minute. Amen. You see, I, I am, I am, I'm not boasting, but I'm a good minister. You're a good minister. Because I'm keeping you in remembrance That's right. of what the Word of God said. That's right. The Bible told me what I am if I keep you in remembrance. Do you hear this? If the, in 1 Timothy 4 and verse 6. What is it? If thou put the brethren in remembrance of if these things. If you put the brother in remembrance of these things. Thou shalt be a good minister. You will be a good minister. Of Jesus Christ. Of Jesus Christ. Never stop. Nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine. That's what I want you to be nourished up. Nourished up. I want you to be all fat from the preaching. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That's why we got milk to give you and meat to give you and bread to give you. That's right. Nourished up. When you come to church, Hallelujah. come to eat. That's right. Don't come to socialize. No. Don't come to look for a wife. Don't come to look for a husband. That's right. Don't come because you miss your friend. That's right. I don't care who you miss. Amen. You come to church to hear yeah. from God and eat God's hallelujah. That's right. Eat God's word. That's right. Hallelujah. Don't forget hallelujah. what church is for. That's right. Church is for nothing else. Glory to God in the days of Noah. Amen. When God instructed him to build an ark for the saving of the house, the ark represents the church. That's right. Eh? Thank God when the ark, the ark couldn't move until the water came. That's right. I said the ark couldn't move right. until the water came. That's right. Amen. The church can't move until water comes. Amen. What water? This speaking of the of spirit. The spirit. Right. Hallelujah. Yeah. That's right. Your church needs the spirit of God. Amen. Thank God when the water began to build up, the ark began to rise. That's right. And sell afloat. Amen. When the spirit of God built up in you, you'll find yourself rising. Oh, yeah. Growing. Hallelujah. Growing. Hallelujah. In knowledge and wisdom and divine understanding. That's right. That's right. But you have to get this in you. Amen. The Holy Book says. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these if things. If you put the brothers in remembrance of this. Thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ. You'll be a good minister. Of Jesus Christ. That means that Jesus will be pleased with you. That's right. Nourish up. In the words of faith. In the good words. Doctrine. That give us belief. And of good doctrine. What, how, what kind of doctrine? Good doctrine. Good. The truth of God doctrine is good. Good doctrine. Not corrupt. That's right. Not mixed with the ideology and the feelings of men. That's right. Wonderful. Not mixed with my opinion. No. The moment the opinion of men get in there, that doctrine ceases to be good. It becomes corrupt. That's right. Hallelujah. Now I have to give you good doctrine. Good doctrine. Pure scripture. That's right. Nothing watered down. That's right. If you can't take it, that's you. You might as well just stick around until you can adjust to the bitterness thereof. That's right. When it hits your mouth, it's sweet. When it gets to your belly, it'll be bitter. Oh, yeah. We're not going to dilute it. No. We're not going to water it down. Oh, no. no, sir. Oh, no. Amen. Wonderful. Brother. This is a straight drink here. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> Ah! That's right. Straight train. That's right. Amen. Amen. 
We ain't putting no seltzer water in it either. Oh, no. We ain't watering this stuff. Hallelujah. This stuff down. No way. No, sir. Amen. It's a straight drink. That's you right. know, I seen men when I was a child drink straight liquor. Yeah. Boy, they cut their face up. Amen. That man, there was a man that me and William used to know. He lived next to William's name, Mr. Bowman. Yep. Bowman used to drink straight vodka. That's right. No water. That's right. Nothing. That's right. He filled that glass up and drank it. And man, the face he would make. Amen. He would make a face. Then he would yell. Ah! That's right. Me and William would say, Mr. Bowman. If, if, if it's that bitter, why are you drinking? After he clapped, he said, he get his breath. He said, it's good. <laughs> Man. It's good. Yes, it would. That's why this hard preaching. Hard preaching. Many of you sitting here, many of you watching, frown. Yeah. Frown. Oh, yeah. Why? Your digestive system. Having a jest to the strongness of the drink. That goes for you watching. That's, right. That's why you folks love your false prophet in your false church. Mm-hmm. He give you that little sugar water. Amen. You drink that all day. Oh yeah. He tell you it's three God. You say, yeah. <laughs> three God, one for the Father, one for the Son, one for the Holy Ghost. That's right. Three gods. That's right. Sugar water. Amen. We come slap that sugar board out your hand yeah. and tell you, you're going to drink one God or go to hell. That's right. <laughs> huh? You're going to drink one God or go to hell. Amen. And this is why the religion of men has always been more appealing than the ways of God. That's right. You want a divorce? There's a religion that man got that has used the Bible. Yeah. To make you feel justified. Right. You want to be a homosexual? There's a religion out here where you can be all homosexual and they'll try to use the Bible and they always will try to go to scriptures. God is love. That's right. Jesus is love. Jesus is love. Jesus is love. Jesus love and homosexuality ain't got nothing in common. No. Not at all. No, no. All right, let's go back to study to show yourself. Come on now. Back in 2 Timothy chapter 2, when we're at verse 14. Follow me. Of these things, put them in remembrance. Of these things, make them in remembrance. Put them in remembrance. Charging them before the Lord. Charge them before God. That they strive not about words to no profit. Do you hear this? Amen. Don't strive to words to no profit. But to the subverting of the hearers. To the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman. Yeah. Amen. You want God's approval. Study. That's right. Don't just write scriptures down and go home. Study. Study. Get your Bible. Turn that message on. That's right. Your soul depends on it. That's right. Study. The many thousands of letters I get from around the world from men and women, 70s, 80s. Amen. Telling me how they learn more from this program than all the years they've been on the planet. Mm. One man wrote me, he said, I'm not used to a preacher saying everything in the Bible. Amen. <laughs> and most people, they're not used to it. That's right. Bible for everything. 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 That's right. Bible for you going to hell and Bible for keeping you out of hell. That's right. Everything. Everything. Study to show thyself. Study to show thyself. Approve Approve unto God. Unto God, what shall we do? A workman. You got to work at it. That's right. That's right. Hmm? That's right. Not just study and sit back. No, you got to do some work. Workman. What is it? A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Won't be ashamed, rightly, rightly interpreting the word of truth. You see, once you get this in you and get the knowledge of God in you, you'll be able to rightly, rightly divide interpret the word of truth. Rightly explain. That's right. Rightly divide the word, the word of, truth. of truth. That means you'll cut the scriptures evenly. Evenly. That's right. Hmm? That's right. When you rightly divide a thing, you're cutting it. Amen. What cuts the scripture? Your divine revelation. Will cut the scripture. Right. You'll cut the prophets. Yeah. 
and you'll cut the apostles and take what the prophet said and take what the apostles said and when it's rightly divided, neither one is contradicting the other. That's right. Glory to God. You, div you rightly, rightly divide. Why? Listen. Whenever something, when food is cut yeah. or divided, the purpose for it to be divided so every so it can be distributed evenly That's right. and everybody can eat. That's right. So I have to come along and rightly right. cut yeah. and then make distribution. Feed the church of God. Feed it. That's right. Feed it. That's right. That's right. Over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. Feed the church of God. That's right. Take feed heed it. therefore. Listen. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Do what? Take heed therefore unto yourselves. Take heed. Unto yourselves. Unto yourselves. And to all the flock. And to the church. Over the which the, over Holy, the, Ghost which the Holy Ghost has made, has you made gave you the oversight for what reason? To feed the church of God. Imagine being an overseer. You ain't got sense enough to know what the people need to eat. Amen. When I came up and my mother cooked food, there was no such thing. It was eight of us. It was eight of us, and uh, they always had somebody else living with us, always reaching out, taking care of somebody. So it was nine and plus. <laughs> and whoever was being raised among us, they didn't have no special privileges. Yeah. They had chores. They had to eat what we eat. Ain't nobody come in my mother's kitchen and say, I don't eat that. That's right. Once she ball up them Raleigh, North Carolina lips and give you them North Carolina eyes, you <laughs> ate or went hungry. Amen. There wasn't a bunch of us in the kitchen. Mm-hmm. Mm -mm. There was one kitchen boss. Amen. And when she said, all right, time to eat, everybody had to come eat. That's right. When mama say so. Yeah. And if you didn't come when mama said, if mama said, you don't, you eat now, don't you come back in this kitchen. That's right. Then you wasn't allowed to come back in the kitchen. You get laid in bed fast. <laughs> you fast when you didn't intend on fasting. Amen. But you fast anyway. Amen. So listen at the word of God. Everybody all right? Get this now. Acts 20 and verse 28. What is it? Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock. Uh -huh. Over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. The purpose of having the oversight is to do what? To feed the church of God. When the brothers, when we set up churches around the world yeah. and put brothers in the pulpit, what we put them there for? To feed the church of God. No, to make girlfriends. To feed the church of God. No, to steal church money. To feed the church of God. No, to be out partying late Saturday. To feed the church of God. Amen. They're in the pulpit for what reason? To feed the church of God. And if they can't feed the church of God, then get out the marketplace. That's right. That's right. Huh? That's right. You got to get, and you bear in mind, you got to feed your wife and children the same grub. That's right. Your wife and children got to eat from the same plate. Amen. That everybody else eat out of. That's right. Amen. You give the church steak and it's tough. Your wife and children got to chew on the same thing. That's right. Amen. That's right. You give the church grits. Your wife and children got to eat the same thing. Yeah. You give the church oatmeal. Wife and children got to get the same thing. That's right. I'll make them that as an example. I don't want you to take that literally because, <laughs> you know, there's some folks, you know, they, they just don't catch up with what I'm talking here. That's true, Pastor. In other words, everybody get the same thing. That's right. Amen. Amen. Do you hear this? Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves. And Take heed. The flock. That's why you have a mess out there, viewers, because these men running around made themselves preachers, and they're just doing anything. That's right. Doing, it, I mean, anything, leading folk to hell, sincere people. Amen. Many people, sincere, want to be right, being led to hell. That's right. We are determined to do this thing right. I refuse to move to the left or to the right for anybody yeah. about anything. Amen. It ain't no such thing. Well, you know, if I get close to Pastor Jennings, I change his mind. 
No, and it'll be right. icicles in hell before that happens. Yes, it will. Because I don't get that close to nobody. That's right. That's right, Pastor. Changing me is like changing the sun into the moon and the moon to the sun. That's how easy it is. Amen. 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 If my wife can't change me, and I hear she and I have been together 44 years. Mm. If she can't change me, point, point to the Bible, mm. who in the world do you? I wouldn't care if you was Gabriel's niece. Amen. And when he spread his wings, you came from under it. That's right. Fully dressed and came down to the earth with a basket of eggs. Amen. I wouldn't care if you was Gabriel's cousin if he got one, That's right. in which he don't. Because spirit ain't related to nobody. No. But if you said, Pastor Jennings, I'm Gabriel's cousin. I come from heaven to be with you, but you got to change this. You're going to find yourself scrambling, asking Gabriel to come get you. That's right. You're going to be scrambling. Somebody said, what's that noise? Well, that fella getting beat with the Bible. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> scrambling. Scriptural scuff marks going to be on him. Amen. When it comes to the Bible, I don't believe in being close to nobody. Oh, no. More than that word. That's right. Why? That's My right. soul is at stake. Yeah. And your soul is at stake if you don't keep in memory what is preached to you. You better get this while you can. Listen. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock. And what? Over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. For what reason? To feed the church of God. He made you overseers for what? To feed the church of God. And? Which he hath purchased with his own blood. Wait a minute. Who's responsible for the existence of the church? Which he hath purchased with his own blood. You see, he purchased it with blood. That's right. When he shed blood and died, he purchased, he purchased the people. That's right. That's what it's meant. You bought with a price. That's right. He bought the church and the price that he paid was death. Uh-huh. For I know this. I know this. And after my departing. Look at the apostle. Give chapter and verse. Acts chapter 20 and verse 29. He's warning the for church. I, for I know this. I know this after I leave. Shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Do you hear this? Amen. Give chapter and verse. Acts chapter 20. We're at verse 29. The apostle said. For I know this. I know this after I leave. Shall grievous wolves enter in a Not body. just wolves. Grievous wolves. Grievous. Grievous. They're no good. That's right. They're dangerous. Grievous wolves. They are tear you apart. Not sparing the flock. They are strip you of your opportunity That's from right. getting right with God. That's right. For I know this. I know this. You know, there's some things that people just won't do. True. When a man of God is among them. That's right. Some things. <laughs> That's right. And there's some folk they wouldn't care if Gabriel was down here. They'd try to shoot him. Amen. When Moses was living, there's some things when Moses was in their presence, Israel wouldn't do. Yeah. But my God, when Moses went up on a mountain and he didn't return quick enough as they thought, the Bible says Israel rose up the play. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. For I know this. I know this. And after my departing shall great hey, hey, we, we that are parents, have you ever left and then came back home and wonder what happened? Children just went plumb wild, like they're making their own video. Children gone wild. Wild, foolish, making a mess, trying to sneak friends to the house. That's right. Trying to sneak company in and all of that stuff. That's what many, many children have done. And then you got to take the rod of correction and turn over the tables like Jesus did and drive everybody out. That's right. Yeah. Drive them out. Beat them in the house. Beat them on the way out the house. Beat them on the porch. Beat them on the sidewalk. Beat them while they're running up the street. Amen. 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 Give them all around American beating. That's right. All right. For I know this. I know this after. After my departure. I leave. Shall grievous wolves, grievous wolves enter in among you. Now, the apostle is warning us of men coming from the outside among the church to destroy what you've been taught. That's right. 
Look out for that. And what else? Also of your own self. Look out from those that sit right in the trap. Also of your own self. Of your own self. Shall men arise. Shall men arise doing what? Speaking perverse things. And what are they speaking perverse things for? To draw away disciples after them. So don't get too close to nobody. That's right. Of your own. I done lived through that. Yes, you have. I done had hypocrite brothers. That's right. Went behind my back spreading false teaching. That's right. False lies. Yeah. They had to go to those locations and bomb them with the Bible. Amen. That's why I tell all members, don't you get too close to no brother we set in the pulpit. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Amen. That's right. When that brother start getting up preaching against the word of God. Yeah. And detour from the teaching. Mm -hmm. Go to him. That's right. That's right. Don't don't. I don't care if he sweat. He can get in the spirit. Wait till his spirit wear off. Amen. When you're talking to him, he starts shaking. You just, 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 just. Wait till he stop. Sha sha. And when he's done doing the cha cha, that's right, Jesus. I don't want to hear that tongue come out of you. When he start cha cha just wait. Amen. That's why there are hundreds of ministers reaching out to me all the time. Amen. Got a new minister that I interviewed. Brought his congregation in. You haven't met him yet. Well, you met him, but you didn't know who he was. His father told the whole church about us. And his father wanted to bring the church in the same year he died. So the brother came up from all places, Raleigh, North Carolina. Amen. My family hometown. Yeah. Amen. So we met with them, had conversation with them, detail, went into doctrine. He said the members got questions. I said, meet with the members before you conclude to come over here. Go meet with the members that's with you. Get the feedback because I know they're going to have questions for me. And he did that. I said, you got your questions? He said, I got them written down right here. And we went to work. And I put on the Bible for this, put on the Bible for that, put on the Bible for the other, put on the Bible for the other. I have to do this. That's right. He said, well, I consider all the church assets belong to First Church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, I said, well, just, he said, all the money that we save, you can have. I said, just a minute. I said, I don't want your money. He said, we're in Washington, North Carolina, but all the members in Raleigh. What do you think is wise? I said, sell the church you have in Washington and we'll go look for one in Raleigh. Amen. That's what you do. That way they ain't got to drive almost two hours from where they are to there, go right to the city. Right. Get them out the rural area in the country and put them in the city. Wonderful. And then we'll come off down there and put everything in order That's and right. catch some new fish. Yeah. Come on, say, how do you know? I have a, a rod that always stay in water. That's right. It is the will of God. Frank, it's the will of God yeah. that I catch fish all the time. All the time. Caught you, didn't we? Amen. And caught thousands that are watching. It's a good net. They're being caught from all over. Amen. I'm thankful, but I also got to watch. Got to watch. Bible says, also of your own self shall men arise. I done lived through that already. I done had men rise up. Oh, yes. Said Melchizedek was in God. Yeah. Rose up with that damnable teaching. That's right. Amen. That's right. Said black people are the only chosen ones of God. I had to shoot that to pieces. That's right. One brother rose up and said, he tell his family that uh, if, if you're black and baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and have the Holy Ghost speaking in tongue, you are better than the white folk that are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and have the Holy Ghost speaking in tongue. That's a black lie. That's a lie. That's I take the Bible and knock the black out of you. That's right. And knock the white out of you. That's right. My interest is to put Jesus on you. That's it. Huh? That's right. We preach Jesus to him crucified. Oh, yes. 
Glory to God. For I know this. I know this after I went to party. Our grievous wolves. Grievous. Grievous wolves. Amen. Amen. I don't care how much you love one of the ministers. You better listen. That's right. And when he detoured from the Bible, That's question right. him. That's right. And I don't care who he is. Question him. Amen. Do you hear this? For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you. And what else? Not sparing the flock. They won't even spare you. Also of your own selves. But shows they're incompetent. Yeah. Of your own selves. Shall men arise. Speaking perverse they, things. Those the kind of men are men stealers. That's right. They, they're not called and sent of God. They don't have what it takes to go out there to declare God's word and souls come. Amen. So they just try to form cliques That's it. right in the church That's and right. befriend people. That's right. That's right. May let you borrow X amount of money. Yeah. And you feel loyal. Yeah. You try to buy you like a pimp do a two dollar hoe. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And those kind you can tell they can be out there 10, 15, 20, 25 years. Yeah. And they got the same thing that they have now that they have when they went out on their own. That's right. Nothing. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Also of your it own. It takes God to make a preacher. Amen. 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 This is something you can just jump up and do because you got the feeling like you James Brown. No, you can't. God got to make you. Uh, that's right. That's right. If God don't do it, it can't be done. No. When God do it, God put it in him. That's right. The desire who will take God to do it right. That's right. Do you hear this? Also of your own self shall men arise. Remember, it get them that come from the outside and it get them that's right among you. Of your own self. Shall men arise. Of, a, of your own self your shall own self. men arise speaking perverse, perverse things. Thing. To draw away disciples. To, to get members. After them. After them, yeah. therefore. Watch. No. Be blinded by friendship. Therefore, watch. No, just speak in tongue all around them. Therefore, watch. That's right. I don't care if you're reading for the minister. That's right. You ain't got no business getting so close to a minister until when he deviates from the word of God or even start behind closed doors speaking against leadership, you yeah. in this amen corner. That's right. You just as hell bound as the minister. Amen. Therefore, what? What? Therefore, what? I don't have no respect to person. No, you don't. No, you don't. My blood brother's under me. I don't care. That's right. When they come to God, I don't care who you are. Amen. Amen. I remember when I sent my blood brother to a location and the Rocky Mount Church closed the doors. To go where he was. And then when I sent one of the ministers down there to a location, they didn't close the doors. I asked Rocky Mount, who was my brother? Mm. If you're going to close the doors for one, then close it for the other. And if you can't do it for both, you're a hypocrite. That's right. That's right. So in the, in the past, some try to present my brother like he was my assistant pastor. He ain't my assistant pastor, nothing. No, no. He's just one of the helpers like all the other ministers. That's right. And I don't think of him above another minister because he's my blood. See, with me, spirit outweighs blood. That's right. I don't care nothing about blood. Amen. Blood don't follow the word of God. Blood going to go to hell. That's right. Only God can make it like that. Yeah. Because it is the nature of a false prophet to look at blood. Yeah. That's why false prophets always train their sons. That's right. To keep the family name on the church sign and the family legacy on. Yeah. I'm interested in keeping the name of the Lord on the church sign and the word of God on. That's right. Amen. Therefore, watch. Do what? Therefore, what? Problem of a lot of folks, the reason why they can't watch, they're jumping and jerking and shouting too much. Yeah. That's right. Can't watch. That's right. That's right. Therefore. Therefore, watch. And, and while we're watching, what should we do? And remember. 
Right back at remembering again. That's right. Therefore, watch and remember. That by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. He warned them how long? By the space of three years. And how was he affected by it? I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Night and day. Night and day. With tears. They troubled him so bad the apostle was telling them and crying. That's right. Why? He saw the church, many being moved, lost, damned. That's right. Because they didn't keep in memory what was preached. That's right. That's right. False prophet come along, no more apostles now. And here's the Bible speak plain. God has set some, he hath. And the, the spirit of deception say, hath mean past. Hath don't mean past. No. Hath mean he established it in the church. That's right. That's right. That's it. God hath. They say that means past. That don't mean past. No. God hath means God established these things in the church. church. He hath done it. They established in there. That's right. How hell deserving. My Lord, my Lord. You don't believe in tithing? Why you take them? Well, that's something. You don't believe in tithing? Why they take them? Amen. I went to Mississippi and fed. Preacher told me later on, we, we went down there and preached, and we left all the money there. Mm -hmm. All the tithing and the offering. And he, and he cried, thanking me. He said, I can take this. And I, I, he said, I'm doing work on the church. I said, you take it and do whatever work you're going to do. I said, you can put your new carpet down. Then later on, told me you don't believe in tithing. Then take your carpet up. That's right. <laughs> huh? That's right. Take your carpet back up. Because that's hypocrisy. Amen. You believe in tithing enough to get carpet down. And then later on, I don't believe it. Roll that carpet up. Clean the glue off. That's right. Give all the tithing back. Because if you don't believe in it, you should reject it. That's right. That's Am right. I right, I said? Amen. Therefore, watch. Therefore, what? And watch and remember. Amen. If you don't get this in you, somebody come in here with a damnable doctrine. Yes, they will. That's why sometimes when guest preachers, if we put them up, and they see the whole congregation is quiet and listening. Some of them get upset. Mm -hmm. I remember on Briar Road, there was a preacher. I think his name was Townsend yeah. from the Tidewater area. Because we always taught the people, listen. That's right. Don't be so quick to yell, amen, amen, listen. And he got up there preaching and whatnot, carrying on. The whole building was quiet. He, he, he wasn't used to that. He got so angry, he started yelling. I feel hatred. Yes, he did. I see hatred. <laughs> That's right. Yes, he did. He said, hatred, everybody. <laughs> there wasn't nobody hating him. That's right. Everybody was simply quiet, mm -hmm. listening. listening. Your ear tries words. That's right. As mouth doeth meats. That's right. Try it. Right. Glory to God. Therefore, watch. Therefore, watch. This is the instructions given from the apostles to the church. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years... By the space, do you see how dedicated they was? Amen. And the love they had for the church? That by the space how of three years... How they was warning the church while they lived? That's right. He said by the space of, of three years... I cease not I to warn cease, everyone. That means in three years, he was consistent in warning the church with the same teaching, and he was very emotional about it. Everyone night and day with tears. How often? Everyone night and day with tears. Night and day. Why? He saw them slipping away into hell. Away. That's right. That's right. Hmm? Amen. Study! Study to show thyself approved unto God. Give chapter and verse again. Back in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. You want God's approval. That's right. That's what I live for. God's approval. I don't look for the approval of people. No. 
I don't care if I never get their approval. Amen. I want God's approval. That's it. That's it. That's I'm saying, folks, write me. You the most arrogant thing I've ever seen in my life. I said, all right, I got God's approval. Amen. I hate you. Thank God for you. I still got God's still. approval. That's right. I comment last week how someone sent me a letter so hateful and said, Pastor General, I wish you just die. Die, die, die. So one of the viewers from somewhere, I don't know who they are, they, they, they did it in reverse. They said, Pastor Jennings, why don't you just live? Live, live, live. Thank God for that. Amen. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Man wrote me not that long ago. He said, one of the greatest days of my life is when I hear you're dead. He said, the day I hear you're dead, I'll be happy. And, he, and then he put in there, I'll be watching you next week. <laughs> Why are they so upset? Wow. Because the whole religious world are like spoiled babies. That's right. You know, a spoiled child cannot take discipline. No. You take a parent and let their child do anything. Run all on the couch with their shoes on. Never wash their hands before they go in the refrigerator. Think they too tender to do chores around the house. That's right. That's right. Can't sweep, can't mop, can't move a chair, can't wipe off a table. Amen. Well, what can he do? That's right. That's right. That's right. But then let them go to grandpa and grandpa house, grandma house, yeah. where chores are mandatory. That's right. Clean up, pick up. That's right. Wash them dishes, yeah. mop that floor, sweep that floor. Yeah. Wash your hands before you go in the refrigerator. Get your feet off that couch, boy. The grandma and give you a look. You know, old folks say if looks can kill. <laughs> That's right. You jump on grandma's couch. I don't care if you ain't grandma's presence. And your mama there. Your mama gets sitting there. <laughs> grandma come back in, wiping her hands on her apron. What, what that child doing? I'm oh, just jumping on the couch, mama. With them shoes on? Yeah, that's right. Girl, if you don't get that baby shoes off my couch, I'll be both of you. <laughs> that's right. Why? She still enforced old school discipline and rule. Yeah. Weak, frail, feeble, timid, worthless teaching. Here, O ye children, have came in churches, yes. watered down everything. That's true. That's true. Church full of long-haired men. Yeah. Practically every man sitting there looking like a sissy. Looking like that's right. Half-naked women, two and three wives, all across the pulpit. Yeah. Women look like prostitutes everywhere, half naked. That's right. Look just like a club. Yeah. Dress in blouse and hat, sparkle so much, you would think you've been charged up overnight. <laughs> like they're from Hollywood Boulevard. That's true. Even preachers got on suits, look like glitter all over. That's right. Hollywood star swinger. That's right. Huh? Hollywood star swinger. Don't want to be holy no more. No. Preacher come, false prophet come along and tell you, don't you worry about having your dresses long no more. And the flesh don't want them long no way. No way. False prophet just said, that's a cup. If you got a nice shape, how you expect to get a man if you got your whole body covered? Show that stuff Show and flaunt it. That's right. And because the flesh wants to do it, you come back to check with a skirt or a dress short as my jacket. Yeah. In fact, it ain't nothing but a jacket. True. That's true. You know, because some folk dresses ain't nothing but a jacket. You can put a jacket on and got a split in that and cut down in there. And then come to church. Oh, yeah.
Preacher's wife, thighs all showing. Preacher's daughter, thighs all showing. And you religious fools ain't got sense enough to see that's indecent. That's right. I believe uh, Jeremiah 5.30. Let me see if that's what I want. Amen. Fifth chapter book of Jeremiah and the 30th verse. Follow me and get me. I want to soak you a little for your salvation. Jeremiah chapter 5, we're at verse 30. Uh -huh. A wonderful and horrible thing. That's what I want. Amen. God talking. A wonderful and horrible thing. A wonderful thing. Amen. And horrible, horrible thing is committed in the land. Took place on earth. The prophets prophesied falsely. The prophets, the messengers all out here. Falsely. They prophesied falsely. There was some fella uh, calling himself critiquing the message that we preached in the gymnasium about how to dress when we had those mannequins demonstrating. Some white fella, I don't know who he was. Talking about, well, you see, I came out of church like that. And he commented on when I pulled my wife up and Sister Belly up and showed what was modest. Right. And he said, you see that? That's the symbol of cultism. Mm. Them two women got on black. I just happened to pull them two up. Them wasn't the only two modest women in the congregation. That's right. It's women wearing black. It's cultism. Yeah. But it show you yeah. how the flesh of women want to be seen in religion. That's right. The religious, any time a religious leader will fight to expose the women's bodies in the church. Amen. That church cannot be of God. It no. just can't. No, no. That's a club with the name Jesus. When these preachers tell you, it doesn't matter how you look, that's a lie out of hell. That's true. That's true. You got the look of a hooker and you got the look of a child of God. That's and right. you mean to tell me they're the same? That's right. That's right. Are you that dumb? Amen. What I look like up here preaching with a blood bright red suit. Yeah. Blood, bright red Pope shoes. Blood, bright red shirt. Amen. Blood, bright red tie. I'm all, I'm the red man. Red man. We bring before you our apostle, Bishop Red. That's right. I'm like a red fox. <laughs> all glowing. That's right. Looking like a regular Gerard Avenue pimp. That's right. And you got men 79 years old, hair dyed black, and you can see the gray roots in it. Right. Amen. Got their mustache all dark like they Groucho March. That's right. Got their eyebrows all color. Face the fact, you's an old fool. No. Amen. You claim you a bishop, an overseer, an elder. Are right, you listening to the old troublemaker? A wonderful and horrible thing is committed. A wonderful and horrible thing. And horrible thing is committed in the land. Committed in the land. The prophets, the prophets prophesied falsely. They prophesied falsely like the evangelicals. Mm -hmm. They still write me. You said Trump ain't got a second time. We believe he's gonna win in 2014. I don't care if you do in 2014. I'm dealing with now. Now. Your lie still holds now. That's right. He can do whatever he wants in 2014. What do I care? He can float a boat for all I care. That prophecy that you made that passed, you're all hypocrites and lied on God, and you still got to repent for it. That's right. Uh -huh. The prophets prophesied falsely. And what? And the priests. And the preachers. They're ruled they by are their in the pulpit. How do they get in the pulpit? By their means. And how do the people look at it? And my people love to have it so. Amen. Love it. That's right. That's right. Church people having a wedding mm -hmm. and at the reception, everybody dancing. Amen. Church people. Everybody gets dancing. 
huh? If they can't, then they stand in one spot. I don't know what that is. But. Church people. That's right. Bishop slow dragon with his wife when they give him a birthday anniversary. That's right. Church people. That's right. What in the world have you become? Yeah. You're just like Israel when Moses was on a mountain. The Bible speaks plain how they rose up to play. That's why you get upset with me because I won't play house. That's right. You're going to die one day. Yeah. They're dying. Oh, yeah. The virus is still out. Yeah, they're dying. That's right. One of the boxers just died that I came up watching. Marvelous Marvin Hagler. Dead. Died at 66. Dead. No God, but dead. That's true. Nobody, celebrity status keeps you here. That's right. Your money don't put you in a position to stay here. No. The prophet said, prepare to meet thy God. That's right. If you die today, viewer, are you ready to meet God? I don't care if your reverend said, I seen brother Johnny James going to heaven. No, he ain't. No. He ain't seen nothing. No. He's a liar. That's right. Johnny James didn't live to please God. Johnny James is going to hell with the devil. That's right. Mr. Johnny James. Amen. The Holy Ghost said. A wonderful and horrible thing is committed in the land. And what? The prophets prophesied falsely. The prophets prophesied falsely. And the falsely. Falsely. How many of you watching? Your preacher came to you in some tongue who already married. The Lord spoke to me. You and my wife. Har, har, har. He almost purring it out. Right. Ain't even no tongue behind it. Just purring. purring. Amen. You and my wife. The Lord says you and my wife. And you sit there like a fool with a detached fake eyelash. <laughs> He got a hypocrite spirit and you got one. He's har and you up there han na 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 san na 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 san na 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 san na 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 and har. That's right. Sound like a 1960 duop group. Amen. Many of you watching, you bear witness, cause some of you looking, you don't got your proposal from some false prophet who's already married. That's right. And you fell for it. That's right. Any of you watching me now, and you got married to your pastor, you got married to any preacher, and his first wife is living, you ain't nothing but living in fornication. He's living in adultery. In adultery. I don't care if you're related to Pastor Jennings. That's right. I got some relatives, fell for it. Mm. Niece fell for a false prophet who already got a wife. Married him. You're going to hell for that. That's right. You're living in fornication. That's right. You know I don't care who you are. No. Well, Pastor, Uncle Gino ain't going to speak to you again. What do I care? Amen. I'm trying to get you to meet God. That's right. I don't care if you never speak to me. That's right. Come on back to the Bible. Yeah. All right, let's close out with Acts 38. Now read this scripture, Pastor. One All right, read the scripture real quick, Mr. Williams. Come on. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 2 and verse 12. Says what? Therefore, let us lie and wait for the righteous because he is not for our return. Let us lie and wait for the righteous. Because he is not for our return. He is not for us. And he is clean contrary to our doings. Yes. He upbraided us with our offending the law uh -huh. and objected to our infamy, the transgressings of our education. Give chapter and verse again. That was the wisdom of Solomon, chapter 2, and the at verse 12. wisdom of Solomon, chapter 2. And at verse 12. Verse 12. And objected to our infamy. The Go ahead, uh, verse 11, at verse 11, quickly. At verse 11. Let our, strength be of, let our strength be the law of justice. Yes. For that which is feeble is found to be nothing worse. Yes. Therefore, let us lie and wait for the righteous. Let us lie and wait 
for, for the right. them that are right. Because he is not for our turn. You see, the righteous is not for the wicked. That's right. Uh -huh. And he is clean contrary to our doings. And the righteous is contrary to the doing of the wicked. He upbraideth us with our offending the law. He upbraideth with us offending the law. And objecteth to our infamy. And he object to our infamy. To our infamy. The transgressings of our education. Because we learned things and didn't live by it. Right. That's right. That's right. I object to your education. Yeah. What you're learning is wrong, and then the things that are right that you're learning, you're many not living by it. That's right. That's what that is, isn't it? Amen. School is a sin. Education is a sin. That depends on what you're learning. What you're learning. That's right. All right, let's educate them and close with Acts 238. Then Peter said unto them, repent. Go to school now. Amen. Amen. And do this. Then Peter said unto them, repent. Well, I got to learn what that word means. Yeah. I got to be educated, educated. to the, what that word means. That's right. Repent. Somebody say, well, what's that? Mm -hmm. I got baptized, but I ain't never repented because I didn't know what it was. Right. You got to be educated to uh, explain that word. That's right. When you repent, you're sorry. You're convicted. The word them pricked your heart. Yep. That's why the word talks about they that gladly receive his word were baptized. But for first, it was pricked in, pricked their, heart in their heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? It got their heart. That's right. You got to be sorry about your wrong men and women. Yeah. Word of God work on your heart. The holy message of Jesus will work on your heart. That's right. Leave all false prophets alone. Who? All of them. Let them alone. Yeah. Jesus said, let them alone. If the blind leave the blind, they both fall into the ditch. That's right. Listen. Then Peter said unto them, repent. Repent. And be baptized every be one of Be sorry. Right. Ask God to forgive you. That's right. Be convicted from your heart about your wrong. Yeah. Then it's time to be baptized. Go down in water. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. For what reason? For the remission of sins. That's how you get your sins removed. That's how you get your sins washed away. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And you'll be filled with God. Amen. Anybody here want to obey that and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ? Stand on your feet now. If you want to be baptized the right way and come out of your false church, stand on your feet. Wonderful. Wonderful. So all of you that are standing, come on around and come on to the front here. All of you that are standing, come on around to the front here. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Got thoroughly educated today. Oh, yes. Amen. Thoroughly educated. Amen. And viewers, you'll be thoroughly educated. Just keep watching. Right. Stop wasting your shoe leather and coffee and gas going to some old phony church. <laughs> That's right. Come out of your churches, everybody. Leave your church. And don't you step back at all. Once you repent of your sins and go down in the water in the name of Jesus Christ, don't you go back to your church. Right. Because if you do, even if you got the right baptism, you still will go to hell baptized right. Yeah. Look at the souls coming to obey God. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> All right. Thank God for you. Prayer begin at five o'clock, God willing. Let us all stand. Minister Dan Thompson, by the grace of God, will close us out in prayer. Heavenly Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we thank you again, Lord God, for this day. We honor thee and praise you, O God, for thou art the one and only true living God that's made all things. We thank you for your word this day, O God. We pray you let it go out over the airways, into the foreign lands, and in this land. Let every soul consider, my God, their eternal destiny. O God, give them an understanding, I pray, Lord God, and thereafter help them to keep in memory the things that they have heard, that lest they believe in vain. Hear us, I pray, O God, at this time, and give us strength and give us the victory. These things we ask in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters in Christ, I would like to thank God for allowing us to come together, even from different corners of the world, to delve into His Word. Thank God for sending a leader like Pastor Gino Jennings. It is a blessing to witness how technology can bridge the physical divide and unite us in our pursuit of spiritual growth and understanding. I want to personally thank each one of you for tuning in and devoting your time and attention to this study. Your eagerness to learn and explore the depths of Scripture is truly inspiring. I hope and pray that you have found value in today's discussion, that it has touched your heart, and that you have gained insights that will shape your faith journey. Remember, the Bible is an endless wellspring of wisdom, and as we continue our virtual gatherings, my earnest desire is that we continue to learn together, grow together, and be transformed by the timeless truths it holds. I encourage you to keep seeking the truths of God's Word and to apply them in your daily lives, allowing them to shape your thoughts, words, and actions. I want to extend an open invitation to subscribe for Bible studies, biblical news, sermons, and more. Together, we will embark on a new chapter, exploring new passages and delving deeper into the mysteries of God's plan for our life. Let us continue to build a community where we can support and uplift one another in our spiritual journeys. Once again, I am truly grateful for your presence and participation. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, guiding you, and bringing you peace. Take care, and may God bless each and every one of you abundantly. Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. Today, I want to talk to you about the importance of repentance in our Christian walk. Repentance is not just a one-time event that happens when we first come to Christ but it is a continual process of turning away from sin and turning towards God. The Bible teaches us that repentance is necessary for salvation. In Acts 2, 38, Peter said to the crowd, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We cannot receive forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit without first repenting of our sins and turning towards God. Repentance involves a change of heart, a change of mind, and a change of direction. It means acknowledging our sinfulness and turning away from our sinful ways. In 2 Corinthians 7, 10, Paul writes, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. Repentance is not just feeling sorry for our sins, but it is a genuine sorrow that leads us to turn away from sin and towards God. Repentance is also a key component of sanctification, the process of becoming more like Christ. In Romans 12, 2, Paul writes, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Repentance is a part of renewing our minds and transforming our hearts to be more like Christ. It is important to remember that repentance is not just for the unsaved. Even as Christians, we still struggle with sin, and we must continually repent and turn towards God. In Revelation 2, 5, Jesus says to the church in Ephesus, Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. We must constantly evaluate our lives and turn away from sin, returning to our first love for Christ. In conclusion, repentance is an essential part of our Christian walk. It is necessary for salvation, sanctification, spiritual growth, and maturity. It involves a change of heart, mind, and direction, turning away from sin and towards God. As we continue to walk with Christ, let us continually examine our hearts, confess our sins, and turn towards God in repentance. May we strive to live a life that is pleasing to God and brings glory to His name. Amen.
Gracious and loving Father, we humbly come before you, acknowledging your presence in our lives. We are grateful for this opportunity to seek your wisdom and guidance as we reflect on the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 16 verse 7. Your word reminds us that I do not want to see you now and make only a passing visit. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. Oh Lord, as we meditate on these words, we recognize the profound truth they hold. You are not a God who rushes past us, but a God who desires to spend time with us, to commune with us, and to guide us along our journey. We are reminded of the precious gift of time and the importance of investing it in relationships, especially with you our Heavenly Father. Lord, we confess that in our fast-paced world, we often find ourselves consumed by busyness and distractions. We can easily lose sight of what truly matters in life, forgetting to allocate time for fellowship with you and nurturing our relationship with you and nurturing our relationship with you. Forgive us, Father, for neglecting the moments of quiet solitude with you, for filling our days with endless activities that leave little room for spiritual nourishment. Today, we pray for the wisdom to embrace the invitation you extend to us in 1 Corinthians 16. Help us to make intentional choices to spend quality time with you, not just in fleeting moments, but in deep and meaningful communion. Teach us to prioritize our relationship with you above all else, recognizing that in your presence lies our strength, our peace, and our joy. Lord, we also ask for your guidance in our relationships with others. May we be mindful of the importance of spending time with our loved ones, family and friends, family and friends. Grant us the wisdom to cultivate healthy and meaningful connections, to invest in the lives of those around us, and to be present with open hearts, listening ears, and compassionate spirit. Help us to see the opportunities for fellowship that you place before us and to seize them with love and grace. Father, we pray for your divine guidance and provision in our lives. Help us to discern the moments when we need to slow down, to step away from the chaos, and to find solace in your presence. Strengthen our faith, Lord, and grant us the endurance to persevere through trials, knowing that you are always by our side, ready to spend time with us if we seek you. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the reminder found in 1 Corinthians 16, 7. May it resonate within our hearts and inspire us to make intentional choices to spend time with you and with those whom you have placed in our lives. We surrender our schedules, our plans, and our desires to you, trusting that as we prioritize you and invest in relationships, you will lead us on a path of fulfillment, joy, and everlasting love. We come before you today, humbled by your infinite grace and overflowing love. We stand in awe of your wisdom your power, and your everlasting presence in our lives. As we gather together, we seek your guidance and strength, knowing that you are the source of all comfort and hope. Lord, we are reminded of the words written by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 16 verse 7, For I do not want to see you now and make only a passing visit. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits these words speak to the deep desire for fellowship and connection, and they resonate within our hearts as we gather here today. Father, we lift up our hearts and souls to you, asking that you grant us the opportunity to spend precious time in your presence. Help us to discern your will, to align our desires with yours, and to walk in step with your divine plan for our lives. Just as Paul longed to spend time with the Corinthians, may we too experience the richness of genuine fellowship, both with you and with one another. Lord, we recognize that time is a precious gift and it is easy for us to become consumed by the busyness and distractions of this world. We often find ourselves rushing from one task to another, neglecting the importance of spending quality time with you and with our loved one. So, we ask for your forgiveness for the times we have failed to prioritize what truly matters. Father, as we reflect on 1 Corinthians 16, <laughs> We pray for divine appointments and divine connections. Open doors for us, Lord, that we may share the gospel, extend a helping hand to those in need, and be a beacon of your love in this world. Give us the discernment to recognize the opportunities you place before us and the courage to step out in faith. We also lift up those who are feeling lonely and isolated. May your spirit comfort them and remind them of your unending presence. Help us as a community of believers, to reach out and embrace those who feel disconnected 
extending a hand of friendship and love. Lord, we pray for our families, our friends, and our neighbors. May our relationships be deepened, strengthened, and enriched as we invest time and effort into building meaningful connections. Show us how to prioritize our time wisely, carving out moments to listen, to share, and to grow together in unity and love. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of time and the opportunities it presents. Help us to use it wisely, to cherish each moment, and to invest in what truly matters. May our lives be a reflection of your love and grace, and may our time be spent in ways that honor and glorify you. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. As a Christian, it is important to address the issue of spiritual fornication and the need to pursue holiness in our relationship with God. In a world filled with enticing temptations and distractions, it is easy to be lured into compromising our spiritual purity. In this video, we will explore the concept of spiritual fornication and discover how we can cultivate a steadfast commitment to holiness. The term spiritual fornication refers to the act of compromising our devotion to God by engaging in practices or adopting beliefs that are contrary to His Word. It involves seeking satisfaction, fulfillment, or spiritual experiences outside the boundaries of God's commands. Just as physical fornication involves illicit sexual activity, spiritual fornication involves compromising our spiritual integrity by pursuing unholy desires and ideologies, guarding our hearts. Proverbs 4.23 reminds us to guard our hearts above all else, for everything we do flows from it. Spiritual fornication begins in the heart, where improper desires and attractions take root. It is crucial to cultivate a heart that is committed to pursuing God and aligning our desires with His will. Holiness as a Lifestyle In 1 Peter 1.16, we are called to be holy because God is holy. Holiness is not merely an external appearance or a set of rules, but a lifestyle that reflects our dedication to God and His standards. It involves separating ourselves from the values and practices of the world and pursuing righteousness, purity, and obedience. The dangers of worldly influences. The world we live in constantly bombards us with messages that contradict God's truth and entice us to compromise our faith. These influences can come through various mediums, such as entertainment, social media, or worldly philosophy. We must exercise discernment, being aware of the subtle ways in which the world seeks to draw us away from our devotion to God. Cultivating a relationship with God Nurturing a deep and intimate relationship with God is essential in guarding against spiritual fornication. Spending time in prayer, studying His Word, and seeking His guidance allows us to align our hearts and minds with His truth. A strong relationship with God provides us with the strength and wisdom to resist temptation and pursue holiness, accountability, and community. Surrounding ourselves with fellow believers who share our commitment to holiness is crucial in our spiritual journey. Engaging in authentic and accountable relationships helps us stay on track as we encourage one another, confess our struggles, and provide support in times of temptation, repentance, and restoration. It is important to remember that none of us are immune to the allure of spiritual fornication. If we find ourselves straying or compromising our spiritual purity, we must turn to God in genuine repentance. He is gracious and forgiving, ready to restore us and renew our commitment to holiness. In a world that promotes self-gratification and compromises godly standards, we are called to stand firm and pursue holiness with unwavering dedication. Let us guard our hearts, be discerning of worldly influences, and cultivate a deep relationship with God. By doing so, we can resist the allure of spiritual fornication and experience the fullness of joy and fulfillment that comes from a pure and intimate relationship with our Heavenly Father. In conclusion, the call to holiness requires vigilance and dedication in a world that often promotes compromise and spiritual fornication. By guarding our hearts, pursuing holiness as a lifestyle, being discerning of worldly influences, cultivating our relationship with God, seeking accountability, and embracing repentance, we can remain steadfast in our commitment to live in accordance with God's will. May we continually strive to uphold the purity and integrity of our spiritual journey, finding strength 
and fulfillment in the presence of our loving and righteous God. As a Christian, it is important to approach sensitive topics with wisdom and grace. While comparing politicians to Satan might seem provocative, it is essential to explore the influences, choices, and impact of political leaders in light of spiritual principles. In this video, we will engage in a reflective discussion aiming to draw parallels that help us better understand the challenges faced by politicians and the importance of holding them accountable. 1. The Temptation of Power Satan is known for his desire for power and authority, and authority as evidenced by his attempt to exalt himself above God. Isaiah 14, verses 12 to 14. Similarly, political leaders often find themselves faced with the allure of power. The pursuit of political influence and control can be tempting, leading some to compromise their values and exploit their positions for personal gain. 2. Deception and Manipulation Satan is the ultimate deceiver, employing cunning strategies to deceive and manipulate. In the political realm, we occasionally witness instances of deception and manipulation as politicians seek to sway public opinion, gain support, or advance their agendas. It is crucial for believers to exercise discernment, carefully evaluating the integrity and motives of political leaders. 3. Moral Dilemmas and Ethical Choices Satan often presents individuals with moral dilemmas, enticing them to compromise their values and principles. In politics, leaders face challenging decisions that require navigating complex ethical landscapes. The pressure to compromise or make choices that contradict biblical principles can be overwhelming. Christian voters should evaluate the moral character and positions of politicians, supporting leaders who align with God's truth. 4. Division and Strife Satan thrives on sowing discord and fostering division. Unfortunately, political landscapes can be marked by polarization, ideological battles, and divisive rhetoric. As Christians, we are called to promote unity and pursue peace. Romans 12, 18 We should be wary of political leaders who fuel division rather than fostering dialogue and understanding. 5. Accountability and Integrity Satan avoids accountability and operates in darkness. In politics, the importance of holding leaders accountable cannot be overstated. Believers should actively participate in the political process, engaging in constructive dialogue and demanding transparency and integrity from elected officials. We have a responsibility to support leaders who demonstrate moral character and a commitment to serving the common good. While it may be thought-provoking to compare politicians to Satan, the intention is not to vilify individuals, but to acknowledge the challenges they face and emphasize the need for accountability. Just as Satan tempts and deceives, political leaders can be vulnerable to similar pitfalls. However, it is important to remember that not all politicians succumb to these temptations. Many are dedicated public servants striving to make positive changes within their communities. As Christians, we are called to engage in the political sphere with discernment guided by biblical principles. Let us pray for our political leaders, that they may seek wisdom, act with integrity, and be open to the leading of the Holy Spirit. May we also exercise our responsibility as citizens to participate actively, promote righteousness, and hold leaders accountable. Ultimately, by shining the light of God's truth, we can contribute to a more just and compassionate society. You're about to discover the poverty programming that's kept you stuck like Chuck in a pickup truck. Make sure you watch this entire video. You know what's really interesting? People will never behave consistently in a way that's inconsistent with their programming. Listen carefully. People will never behave consistently in a way that's inconsistent with their programming. In fact, your programming runs on your subconscious mind. So let's pretend for a minute that your mind is a supercomputer. Get it? Let's pretend. Okay, so let's pretend for a minute that your mind is a supercomputer and you've got your subconscious mind and you've got your conscious mind. In a computer, you have to have an operating system. What is an operating system? An operating system is the main software of a computer that tells the computer what other software programs it can and cannot run. The problem with our supercomputer of our mind is most of us. We did not choose our operating system. The cultural hypnotic societal mechanism chose that for us. And the cultural hypnotic societal mechanism, which includes the schools we went to, the churches we've gone to, our parents, our neighbors, our siblings, 
our friends, our co-workers, our bosses, our employees, the media, the government, all of it has programmed us with what I call a failure operating system. And if you put a failure program in a computer with a failure operating system, it can run that program. But guess what? If you put success software in a computer that's programmed with a failure operating system, all you're going to get is an error message. By the way, that's why so many people, when they hear some truth about wealth, they have to resist it because their subconscious programming won't allow them to run that program. And so success and failure both operate or produced from the subconscious mind, or what I like to call the automatic mind. I like to call our subconscious our automatic mind and our conscious mind our manual mind. All of the results, like 90 of the results in your life, are produced by your automatic mind, which means you're not even aware of it. It's running below the surface. It's happening automatically, and you don't even see it. But here's what's interesting. Other people who are not programmed like you can see your programming. How many are picking up what I'm putting down? And see, what happens is when we hear some truth that's unfamiliar to us, the first thing we do is we resist it because, well, that can't be true because that doesn't go along with my programming. Because people will never behave consistently in a way that's inconsistent with the programming. But here's what's interesting. I don't know if you all can remember back in the 80s, late 80s, when you'd have like the 80, 86 computer, you had the floppy drives, and when they came out with a new software system for the computer, they came out with a new operating system. You had to uninstall the old operating system, which usually took a couple of hours. And then you had to keep putting these floppy disks in and taking one out, putting one in, taking one out, putting one in, taking one out, putting one in. And it took a long time to reprogram the operating system of that computer. Does anybody remember those days? Okay, got a couple of us are old enough to remember those days, okay? And so what happened is they'd make new software, but the new software wouldn't run on the old operating system, right? And so you had to pick a day where, okay, I'm going to have to uninstall this operating system, and then I'm going to have to set an alarm to wake up in the middle of the night and keep on putting these disks in so I could use my computer tomorrow. Well, the same way it took a long time back then to uninstall an operating system and reinstall a new one, it takes a long time for most people to uninstall their failure operating system and install a success operating system. That's why you have to stay plugged into information and content that is reprogramming you. Because eventually, here's what's going to happen. I promise you. You see, how many of you all notice that when you see somebody who's really, really good at something, they're really, really good. They make something so complex look effortless. Like Michael Jordan was so much better than everybody else when he was in the NBA. When he played basketball, he made it look effortless. Tiger Woods made making birdies and eagles look like he was playing with a child's toy. Why? Because they had a totally different operating system going. But see, operating systems don't just affect us in sports. They affect us in every aspect of our lives. They affect us in our finances. They affect us in our businesses. And what happens is we resist because it's uncomfortable to uninstall that old programming. You know why it's uncomfortable? Because Grandmama gave it to me. It's uncomfortable because Mama gave it to me. Because Daddy gave it to me. Because my Uncle Sam gave it to me. And my Aunt Susie gave it to me. And so I don't want to take it out. My favorite teacher gave it to me, and my pastor gave it to me, and the deacon gave it to me. And we have all of this programming that's not serving us and not giving us the ability to serve anybody else. But guess what? Did you ever notice that people who are failing, like, miserably, they make that look effortless? No, seriously, I'm not trying to be funny. You're not saying, I'm just going to wake up and mess up my life today. It's just all the moves they do that day just mess up the whole day. Why? It's their programming. And now watch this. This poverty programming. Like you have been programmed to be broker. The cultural, the cultural hypnotic societal mechanism has programmed you to be sick, broke, misinformed, and fearful. And guess what? As long as you are running this program, you're going to be sick, broke, misinformed, and fearful. Either one of those things or all of those things. Why does the cultural hypnotic societal mechanism want us sick, broke, misinformed, and fearful? Because people who are sick, broke, misinformed, and fearful are easier to control than people who are healthy, well-informed, and courageous. And so what we have to do is we have to recognize the program. We have to recognize where it comes from. Do you understand? Every time the politicians lie to you and tell you they're going to end income inequality, how do you know they're lying? Because they can't end income inequality. Because income doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's the result of something. What's it the result of? It's a result of value that's created for somebody other than you. So until you eliminate value creation inequality, you can't eliminate income inequality. They are lying. The government wants you to think that businesses that are successful are successful because the owners of those businesses are evil. But reality is the promoter of that message is the one that's evil. Now, there are some businesses that are evil. I'm not saying there are no businesses. There are some businesses that where the owners have evil intention. But that's not generally the nature of business. The media, the movies. I'm not crazy about movies. But the movies that I hate the most, superhero movies, I can't stand them. They're so terrible. They have programmed so many people to be broke. Say, what do you mean? Like, you never even thought about that before, right? See? They started programming you when you were a little kid. 
Anybody remember this guy named Superman? Right, Superman. You remember who he was, right? He was an adopted poor little orphan from another planet. He was his arch enemy, Lex Luthor. Lex Luthor. What was he? Multimillionaire. Subconsciously, they don't have C. Do you understand that every time a story is being told, it's being told on two levels? There's the covert story. That's the part that talks to your head. It's only there to distract you. And the overt story. That's the part that talks to your heart. It's there to program you, okay? What about Spider-Man? Oh, another little poor little orphan raised by his aunt and uncle. Who's his arch enemy? Oh yeah, that's right, the Green Goblin. He wasn't a multi-millionaire. He was a multi-billionaire. They're always associating wealth with evil. And I know what you're thinking. See, I already know what you're thinking. Because I'm a mind reader. You're thinking what Batman was rich. How many of y'all were thinking that? I know you were. But you won't catch me on that one. You're right. Batman was rich. But he's the only superhero with no superpowers. Now, which one would you rather do, have a cool car or just fly? Okay, I can't even go there yet. I can't go there yet, but I will. I'll touch on it since you brought it up, okay? Just be ready. Okay? I know the other thing you're thinking. Yeah, but Iron Man's rich, don't you? I'm reading your mind. I already told you. But watch this. Iron Man is a narcissistic jerk who takes advantage and walks over everybody and walks on everybody. So if they make a superhero that's rich, they always give them an undesirable character trait. But what about the Black Panther? See... Here's what the enemy did with the Black Panther. Black people, we felt so disenfranchised that, unfortunately, far too many of us, just because something's black, we want to go with it. But see, here's the problem I had with Black Panther. They were literally in the movie teaching ancestor worship. Ancestor worship. Well, what am I going to worship my dead ancestors for? God's the one that made them. I think I'm going to worship him. Black Panther was cool. He was rich. He was cool. He was smart. He could fight. He did all that. But they had to throw that ancestor worship because the enemy is always trying to trip us up. And he'll use whatever method necessary, whatever method necessary, whatever method possible. See, I'm going to tell you something while I'm on this subject. Our primary identifying factor should not be our color, and it should not be our gender. It should not be our educational level. It should not be the amount of money that we have. It should not be an association that we're a part of. It should not be our fraternity. It should not be our neighborhood. It should not be our country club. Our primary identifying factor of our lives should be the fact that we are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And if that's not first, you got the wrong thing. In first place, I am not black first, by the way. Martin Luther King dreamed of a day when a man would no longer be judged by the color of his skin, but by the content of his character, and now we want to be judged. We just want to judge things by the color of the skin. You understand? Every time we go along with something that's as a black person, every time we go along something with something that's black and whack, we're just doing what the oppressors of our ancestors did. We're agreeing with the oppressors of our ancestors. The most important thing about us is the color of our skin. It's not, I personally like being a brother. You know what I'm saying? I like my brother's swag. You know what I'm saying? I like it. But guess what? If I was white, I would enjoy that just as much because watch this. I made exactly the way God desired me to be. And I'm not in competition with anybody. So I can celebrate you and it don't take anything from me. And I can celebrate me and it don't take anything from you. If you think me celebrating me takes something from you, I'm not the one with the problem. And if I think that you celebrating you as taking something from me, I'm the one with the problem. James, the brother of the Lord. He wrote a book in the New Testament called James. His name was really uh, Yaakov, which is Jacob, but King James. And they changed it to James, and it's not James. But anyway, James, the brother of Jesus. Here's what he said. He didn't say James, the brother of the Lord. He didn't say James, the senior pastor at the Church of Jerusalem. He didn't say Reverend James, the senior pastor, the Church of Jerusalem. Here's what he said. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. That was his primary identifying factor. And if it's good enough for the half-brother Lord, who's a senior pastor at the Church of Jerusalem, it's good enough for me for it to be my primary identifying factor. We have been programmed by the government, by the media. Do you realize that Hollywood started waging war on business in the 1970s? We didn't even see it. By the time the average American turns 18 years of age, They've seen 10,000 people murdered on television and movies by business people and entrepreneurs. They've seen more people murdered on television by entrepreneurs and business people than even career criminals. No wonder people don't want to go into business. All they want to do is save the planet. They've been programmed. Let me say this. You weren't born with any ideas. All of the beliefs you have, somebody, you got them from somewhere. So you might want to check the source before you start running 100 miles an hour in the wrong direction and then end up off a cliff somewhere. See, here's what we got to do. We gotta understand that the results that my life are producing, my life is producing those results automatically. And so if I wanna produce some different results, I have to reprogram my automatic mind. I have to be intentional and I have to be aware. I have to be aware of the fact, like, where is this coming from? I know from Genesis chapter one, there are four levels of value. The lowest level is implementation. Use your muscles. I'm not going to do it that way. Use your muscles over time. 
That's a resource you use to make money. This is why you're broke. What do I mean by that? Wealth is a spiritual result. Wealth is spiritual. It is not physical in its nature. It is spiritual in its nature, because money that you have can be in more than one place at a time. Only spiritual things can be in more than one place at a time. The thing that gives money its value is, there's nothing backing the money. There's nothing backing this money I have in my pocket. The thing that makes it valuable is the message that it carries. $100 bill is more valuable than a penny, even though the material the penny is made out of is worth more than the material the $100 bill is made out of. So if money were material, a penny would be worth more than a $100 bill. But a $100 bill is worth 10,000 times more. Why? Because on a penny it says one cent, which means 1% of $1 bill. But a $100 bill it says $100, which means 100 times $1. So the message that it carries is the thing that makes it valuable. But watch this. The other reason it's valuable is because we believe it's valuable. So the two things that make money valuable are the message that it carries and the faith that it creates. Language is spiritual and faith is spiritual. Wealth is a spiritual outcome. But muscles are a physical resource. Time is a limited resource. We are multiplying a physical resource. Time is a limited resource, and we're attempting to produce an unlimited spiritual result. No wonder you're broke. Second level unification. Unification, second level of value. On that level, we use our management skills to make money. We're not broke yet. You might make anywhere from $40,000 to $250,000 a year. But if a company's paying you $250,000 a year, here's what they want you to know. They want you to know that. They know they own you. They don't care none about your child's recital, your grandfather on his deathbed. Nothing, right? What's the next level? Above that dotted line is where wealth begins to be created. This is communication. This is the second highest level of value. The highest level of value is imagination. Here, your income on the communication level is going to be somewhere between 100000 a year if you sell cars. And it might be $100 million a year if you're a high-level actor or a top singer, or maybe you write songs. Or maybe you write movies. $100 million a year. These are communication imagination. These are people who come up with the best idea. The resource you use here is your mouth. You gotta have a mouth and you gotta learn how to use it. Pretty much everybody here qualifies for the first part. Now you gotta start working on the second part. And then your mind. The resource you use up here for imagination are your mind and your money to make money. When you do that, it will take your life to a whole nother level. But you've been programmed. You've been programmed to stay down here or to work real hard and get a degree so you can move up here. And this you don't even value? Do you realize? And I'm going to end with this. In business school, they don't even teach you how to sell. You go to school for six or eight years to learn how to be a lawyer. They teach you how to practice all this law. They don't teach you how to get any clients to practice law for. You go to school for eight to 20 years to learn how to be a doctor, and they teach you how to work on the human body. They don't teach you how to get any human bodies to work on. We've been programmed to be broke, and poverty program is costing you a fortune. That's why I always say, if you're broke, if you make less than $50,000 a month, you can't afford to be watching television. You need to be using that time to read some books to learn a new skill. But don't you want to see them play basketball? Don't you want to see them in movies? I don't want to see them. I want to be them. I want somebody watching my life on TV. Okay, so that's how people are programmed to be broke for the rest of your life. Don't let the cultural hypnotic societal mechanism program you to be broke because your family deserves better than that. God bless you. Like, subscribe. Peace out. Cub Scouts. Love. The Supreme Commandment. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, today we gather to explore the profound and transformative power of love Love is a central theme throughout Scripture, and Jesus himself emphasized its significance as the greatest commandment. As we embark on this journey, may our hearts be stirred to embrace and embody the love that God has lavished upon us. The Essence of Love Love lies at the core of God's character and His relationship with humanity. In 1 John 4 8, we are reminded that God is love. Love is not merely an attribute of God. It is His very nature. From the creation of the world to the sending of His Son, every act of God is a manifestation of His love. As His followers, we are called to reflect and radiate this divine love in all aspects of our lives. The Commandment of Love Jesus declared that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Matthew 22, 37-37 to 30 time. This commandment encapsulates the entirety of God's law. Love is not a mere suggestion. It is a command that governs our attitudes, actions, and relationships. It compels us to prioritize God above all else and to extend love and compassion to those around us. The depth of God's love. The depth of God's love is demonstrated through his ultimate sacrifice. 
sending his son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins. Romans 5, 8 proclaims, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This sacrificial love, unearned and undeserved, reveals the boundless extent of God's affection for humanity. It is a love that knows no limits, no boundaries, and no conditions. Love in action. Love is not merely a sentiment or emotion. It is active and tangible. It is revealed through acts of kindness, compassion, and selflessness. In 1 Corinthians 13, known as the love chapter, the Apostle Paul eloquently describes the characteristics of love. Love is patient, kind, humble, forgiving, and persevering. It rejoices in truth and protects, trusts, hopes, and never fails. When we truly love, we reflect the very nature of God. Overcoming barriers to love While love is a beautiful and transformative command, we must acknowledge the challenges we face in fully living it out. Our own human nature, pride, selfishness, and prejudices can hinder our ability to love unconditionally. However, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can overcome these barriers and allow God's love to flow through us. As we surrender ourselves to His transforming grace, we are empowered to love even the unlovable and extend grace to the undeserving. The impact of love. When we embrace and embody the love of God, it has profound impact on our lives and the world around us. Love has the power to heal broken relationships, reconcile estranged hearts, and bring unity in the midst of diversity. It breaks down barriers, bridges divides, and offers hope to the hopeless. Love is the language that transcends cultural, social, and racial boundaries, pointing people to the transforming love of Christ. Beloved congregation, love is not a mere sentiment or an optional virtue for believers. It is the very essence of our faith and the commandment that defines our relationship with God and with one another. As we seek to follow Jesus, let us love wholeheartedly, surrendering ourselves to the love that God has poured into our hearts. May our lives be a living testimony of the boundless love of our Heavenly Father, drawing others to experience the transformative power of His love. In the name of Jesus, the embodiment of love, we pray. Amen. Dear viewers, in a world filled with distractions and uncertainties, it is easy to overlook the most crucial decision of our lives, our eternal destiny. Today, I write to you with a sense of urgency, reminding you of the importance of salvation and the necessity of not delaying the decision to embrace Christ. None of us knows when our time on this earth will come to an end and it is vital to seize the opportunity for salvation while we still can. Life is a fragile gift bestowed upon us by our Creator. Each passing day brings with it countless blessings and moments to cherish. However, it also carries the inherent unpredictability of our mortality. Whether through illness, accident, or unforeseen circumstances, our earthly journey can end in an instant. It is this very uncertainty that should awaken us to the urgency of making our souls right with God. Beyond the confines of our earthly existence lies eternity, an everlasting realm where our souls will dwell. The decision to accept or reject the salvation offered through Jesus Christ determines our eternal destination. Scripture teaches us that those who believe in Christ and accept Him as their Lord and Savior will inherit eternal life while those who reject him will face eternal separation from God. The danger of procrastination. Far too often, we find ourselves trapped in the cycle of procrastination when it comes to matters of eternal significance. We believe there is ample time to address our spiritual condition later, as if tomorrow is guaranteed. But the truth is, we do not possess the power to determine the length of our lives. By postponing the decision to accept Christ, we risk eternal consequences. Our Heavenly Father's love for us is immeasurable. He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to offer salvation to all who believe in Him. Through His sacrificial death and resurrection, Jesus offers forgiveness, reconciliation, and eternal life to those who accept Him. God's grace is a gift freely given, but we must respond to His call. The Bible tells us that today is the day of salvation. 2 Corinthians 6, 2 We are not guaranteed tomorrow, and delaying our decision for salvation is a risk we cannot afford to take. 
Embracing Christ is not merely a religious formality. It is a life-altering commitment that ensures our eternal destiny. Procrastination in matters of salvation often leads to regret and missed opportunities. Failing to accept Christ leaves us vulnerable to the consequences of our sins. Without salvation, we face eternal separation from God, an existence devoid of His love, joy, and peace. The gravity of this reality should compel us to act now. Acknowledge your need. Recognize your need for a Savior and acknowledge your sins before God. None of us is perfect and we all fall short of God's glory. Admitting our need for His forgiveness is the first step toward salvation. Turn to Christ. Place your faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God and the only way to salvation. Believe in His death and resurrection, understanding that He paid the price for your sins. Surrender your life to Him and make Him the Lord of your life. Seek guidance and fellowship. Surround yourself with a community of believers who can support and guide you in your faith journey. Seek a local church where you can grow in your understanding of God's Word and receive encouragement in your walk with Christ. Dear viewers, the urgency of salvation cannot be overstated. We do not know what tomorrow holds, but we do have the power to choose our eternal destiny today. Do not delay the decision to accept Christ and secure your place in God's kingdom. Embrace His love, grace, and forgiveness, and experience the joy of salvation. May you find peace and assurance as you respond to this call to salvation, the call to follow God, a journey of faith. Dear beloved congregation, today we gather here as a community of faith, seeking guidance, solace, and spiritual nourishment. As we come together, let us reflect upon the profound and timeless truth that lies at the core of our existence, the call to follow God. This call transcends time and space, encompassing the lives of countless generations. It is an invitation to embark on a lifelong journey, embracing faith and allowing God to guide our steps. The nature of God's call. When we speak of following God, we must first understand the nature of this call. It is not a mere suggestion or a passing notion. It is an imperative, a commandment woven into the fabric of our being. Our purpose in life is intrinsically linked to this call, as we are created in the image of God and designed to walk in harmony with His divine will. God's call is personal and unique for each one of us. Just as He called Abraham to leave his homeland, Moses to deliver his people, and the disciples to leave everything and follow Jesus, God calls us to a specific purpose within the grand tapestry of His divine plan. This call may manifest in various ways through a still, small voice within our hearts, through the wise counsel of fellow believers, or through circumstances that align with God's providential hand. The journey of faith. Following God is not a one-time decision. It is a lifelong journey marked by faith, trust, and obedience. It is an expedition that traverses through valleys of despair, mountaintops of joy, and uncharted territories of uncertainty. Our faith is tested, refined, and deepened as we walk this path. But the promise of God's abiding presence sustains us through every twist and turn. In our journey, we encounter obstacles that seek to deter us from following God. The allure of worldly pleasures, the pressures of society, and the trials of life can distract and discourage us. However, we must remember that God's call is greater than any temporary pleasure or adversity. Through prayer, the study of His Word, and fellowship with other believers, we find the strength and wisdom to persevere, the blessings of following God. While the journey of faith may present challenges, it also brings forth immeasurable blessings. As we surrender our lives to God, He fills us with His love, grace, and peace. The presence of the Holy Spirit guides and empowers us, granting wisdom in times of confusion, comfort in times of sorrow, and strength in times of weakness. Moreover, following God aligns us with His divine purposes. As we walk in obedience, our lives become a reflection of His character, shining a light in a world marred by darkness. Our actions, driven by love and compassion, have the power to impact lives, transform communities, and bring hope to the hopeless. The Call to Discipleship Following God also entails the call to discipleship, Jesus said, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. 
Luke 9 verse 23. Discipleship involves selflessness, humility, and a willingness to lay down our desires for the sake of God's kingdom. It calls us to love our neighbors, serve the marginalized, and be the hands and feet of Jesus in a broken world. Dear brothers and sisters, the call to follow God is not reserved for a select few. It is extended to all who are willing to answer. It is a call that beckons us to a higher purpose, a deeper relationship with our Creator. It is a call that transforms our lives, filling them with meaning, joy, and fulfillment. As we embark on this journey of faith, let us remember that following God is not a solitary endeavor. We are part of a larger community of believers, bound together by our shared commitment to follow God's call. Let us support and encourage one another, lifting each other up when we stumble and rejoicing together in our victories. May we be relentless in our pursuit of God, seeking Him with all our hearts and surrendering our lives to His divine will. In doing so, we will experience the abundant blessings that come from walking in obedience. Our lives will be transformed and we will become beacons of light, reflecting God's love and grace to a world in desperate need. As we leave this sacred space today, may we carry the fire of God's call in our hearts, and may our lives be living testimonies of His faithfulness. Let us go forth with renewed vigor and determination to follow God in every aspect of our lives, trusting that He will guide us, protect us, and lead us to the abundant life He has prepared for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Path of Following God A Journey of Faith, Trust, and obedience. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, today we gather in the presence of the Almighty, seeking guidance and inspiration on our spiritual journey. The topic of my sermon today is one that lies at the core of our Christian faith, following God. It is a profound calling that encompasses our entire existence and shapes the very purpose of our lives. As we embark on this spiritual pilgrimage, let us reflect on the significance of following God the challenges we may encounter, and the blessings that await us along the way. The Call to Follow At the heart of Christianity lies the call to follow God. From the very beginning, God has invited humanity into a personal relationship, desiring us to walk alongside Him. The call to follow is not limited to a select few. It extends to all who seek to embrace His love and live according to His will. It is an invitation to surrender our own desires and brace a life of faith, trust, and obedience. The challenges we encounter? While the path of following God is one of immense joy and fulfillment, it is not without its challenges. The world around us often presents distractions, temptations, and obstacles that seek to divert us from our intended course. Doubts may assail our minds, and the pressures of society can undermine our commitment, yet even in the face of adversity, we are reminded that God is faithful and will provide strength to overcome every trial we encounter. The Faithful Journey To embark on the path of following God requires unwavering faith. Faith that He is the Creator of all things, the source of wisdom and love, and the One who holds our lives in His hand. As we journey, we learn to trust in His divine plan, even when it seems unclear or different from our own expectations. Our faith grows stronger as we experience His faithfulness in our lives, and we find solace in knowing that He is always with us. The Obedience of Discipleship Following God necessitates obedience to His Word and commandments. Obedience should not be viewed as a burden, but as an expression of our love for Him. Through obedience, we align our hearts and minds with God's divine will, allowing His transformative power to work in us we are called to live lives of righteousness and love, exemplifying Christ's teachings and being a light in the world. In obedience, we find freedom, purpose, and true fulfillment, the blessings of following God. The rewards of following God are immeasurable. By walking in His ways, we experience His presence, peace, and joy. He guides us through the darkest valleys, strengthens us in times of weakness, and brings hope to our weary souls. Following God leads us to a life of purpose and significance, where we become vessels of His love and instruments of His grace. In His hands, we find our true identity and destiny far greater than we could ever imagine. 
My dear brothers and sisters, as we conclude this sermon, let us remember that the call to follow God is not a one-time decision but a lifelong journey. It requires our wholehearted commitment, faith, and obedience. Along this path, we may stumble, but God's grace is ever-present to lift us up and set us on the right course. May we embrace the call to follow God with open hearts, allowing His love to transform us, and may our lives be a testament to His faithfulness. Let us go forth, following our Heavenly Father, for He is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Following God, a journey of faith and obedience. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Today I stand before you to share a profound message of hope, encouragement, and challenge. Our topic of discussion today is following God, a journey of faith and obedience. As believers, we are called to walk in the footsteps of our Lord, seeking His guidance, surrendering to His will, and living a life of obedience. Let us embark on this spiritual pilgrimage together as we explore the depths of what it truly means to follow God. The Call to Follow At the heart of our faith lies the fundamental truth that God has called us into a personal relationship with Him. He invites us to follow Him, to align our wills with His divine purpose. Just as Jesus called His disciples to leave everything and follow Him, we too are beckoned to surrender our own ambitions, desires, and plans to walk in the path set before us by our Heavenly Father. Faith, the foundation. Following God demands unwavering faith. Hebrews 11 verse 6 reminds us that without faith, it is impossible to please Him. Faith requires us to trust in God's goodness, His sovereignty, and His perfect plan, even when the path seems unclear or challenging. It is through faith that we encounter the transforming power of God in our lives, and it is through faith that we are able to discern and follow His leading. Obedience, a fruit of love, Obedience is the outward expression of our love for God. When we truly love Him, we strive to obey His commands. Jesus Himself declared, If you love me, keep my commands. John 14, verse 15. Obedience requires humility, submission, and a willingness to let go of our own desires in order to align ourselves with the will of God. As we cultivate a heart of obedience, we grow in holiness and become vessels through which God's love can flow navigating the challenges. The path of following God is not always easy. It may be marked by trials, hardships, and moments of doubt. Yet, in the midst of these challenges, we find reassurance in the promises of God. He assures us that He will never leave us nor forsake us, Hebrews 13 verse 5, and that His grace is sufficient for us, 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9. By clinging to His word and seeking His presence through prayer, we can find strength and encouragement to persevere. Bearing fruit. When we wholeheartedly commit ourselves to following God, our lives bear fruit. The fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Galatians 5 verse 22 and 23 begin to manifest in our relationships, our attitudes, and our actions, our actions. Our lives become a testimony to the transformative power of God, drawing others to Him and inspiring them to embark on their own journey of following God, the eternal reward. Lastly, we must remember that our journey of following God extends beyond this earthly life. As we faithfully serve Him, He promises us an eternal reward. Jesus declared in Matthew 16 verse 27, For the Son of Man is going to come in His Father's glory with His angels and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. The reward may not always be immediate or tangible, but we can trust that our faithfulness will be acknowledged and rewarded in God's perfect timing. My dear brothers and sisters, following God is not a one-time decision, but a lifelong commitment. It requires faith, obedience, perseverance, and surrender. As we embark on this journey, let's remember that we are not alone. God's presence goes before us guiding our steps and empowering us to overcome any obstacle. May we seek His face daily, study His word fervently, and listen attentively to His still, small voice. In following God, we discover our true purpose and experience the abundant life He has prepared for us. Let us encourage one another, 
bearing each other's burdens and spurring one another on towards love and good deeds. Together, let us be a community of believers who shine the light of Christ, making a difference in this world. May the Holy Spirit ignite within us a passion to follow God wholeheartedly, leaving behind the distractions and temptations that seek to hinder us. May our lives be a living testament to the transformative power of faith and obedience, drawing others closer to the heart of God. Let us embrace this journey with joy, knowing that the reward of eternity awaits those who faithfully follow God. And as we continue on this pilgrimage, may we find solace in the words of Psalm 23, verse 6, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Thank you.